Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for um, having a short lunch. Uh, me too, <laughs> to come join the presentation. So today's topic is Internet of Things, IoT, M2M, and we'll discuss how we use Smart Converge Gateway for the smart grid, smart energy, and uh, also apply to uh, the rest of the markets in smart cities. So um, I'm Kwok Wu. I headed up the embedded software and systems at Freescale Semiconductor, which used to be Motorola Semiconductor. And so uh, I assume most of you are expert with Java and uh, OSGI and all this stuff? SE? OK. So maybe you guys can help me uh, answer some of the questions. OK, let me go to this slide mode. OK, so the outline is uh, we'll talk about the market trends and opportunities. Uh, then uh, we talk about the basic in uh, smart grid, uh, which contain the smart sensor network, and then uh, smart gateway using both the data concentrator and in the home gateway. Uh, then we also talk about how we can use the open platform to add the Java and Java SE and Java FX uh, to enable uh, this horizontal platform, so we can add many different vertical um, business uh, solutions on top. Uh, then uh, we'll also talk about how we can extend this uh, platform for supporting other markets such as health monitoring, safety, security, and so on. So uh, this slide shows the explosion of the internet traffic uh, driven by two uh, One is the wireless, second is the video. Wireless contain more than just a mobile phone. Wireless contain all the um, smart sensors that we're dropping in, into the network, such as, uh, whoops, um, uh, such as, uh, whoops, such as all these uh, smart meters and uh, sensors that we're putting into the network, both inside the premise as well as outside the premise. So the mobile traffic is uh, growing five times in three years. And then you can see the data in exabyte per month. And then the number of connected devices are go growing from 10 billion to 15 million. Sorry, B as in billion. 10 billion to 50 billion connected devices by 2020. And uh, how many of you attended the presentation this morning, the keynote speech? No, too early. It started at 8 AM. Uh, OK, but they also talk about all this prediction. Whatever prediction we make will be wrong, because uh, the actual will be even bigger. Um, so uh, the reason of, about this whole uh, explosion would be the adding of all these uh, connected devices, which we call M2M, and then also the Internet of Things. So uh, back to the traditional networking. So we have the thing in the center, which we call the uh, communication, the telecom, telco, the carrier network. And that has both the wire and also the wireless uh, connectivity, like 3G, 4G, broadband. Then on the right-hand side, you can see we have a bunch of connected devices, whether it's your uh, PC, then your handheld, which is your iPhone, iPad. Then, as I mentioned, we are adding all kinds of devices to the network, whether it's the um, smart meters or whether it's uh, IP cameras and so on. There's prediction that IP camera will actually exceed the number of uh, cell phones and mobile phones. Because for each home, if you have a premise of four person, you have four uh, cell phones. And then they're saying is uh, a home potentially can have more than four IP camera. You can have uh, three inside the home and three outside the home and so on. So uh, then we talk about how we can do the intelligent or smart networking. Uh, so if each of these connected devices has to directly access the core network, whether it's through wire or wireless, the core network will not have enough capacity to handle. Therefore, at each premise, you always have some kind of smart gateway. The simplest one is a smart router. But most routers are single function. 
It only connect to a computing device. It doesn't connect to a sensor device. So a smart gateway in the future will have the ability not just doing Wi-Fi connectivity, but also have um, the sensor connectivity, which we call WSN, wireless uh, sensor network, connecting to all the sensor devices. So you will see all kinds of uh, smart converged gateway at all the different premises, which is uh, residential, uh, industrial, enterprise, and offices. Industrial cover, factory, building, uh, and uh, of course, smart energy, which will go uh, into some discussion. Um, then residential, I cover the that mobile, I meant the transportation, the car. The car, if you will, is your second home. So, but it's a moving home. So you will see all this gateway everywhere. So that means smart gateway can go onto your buses, your train, your, your uh, cruise ship, and so on. Okay, so now um, we will go into the uh, energy segment. Uh, within the industrial, you can have energy segment, you can have uh, medical segment. So let's talk a little bit about the energy segment. So uh, before we do that, uh, here's another picture of a smart connected cities or smart world. So again, on the left hand side, you see smart connected cars, smart connected home and buildings, smart energy. Uh, there are two parts in the smart energy. One is the, we call the AMI, advanced metering infrastructure. Then uh, as I mentioned, we also talk about the medical health monitoring. So all these various, uh, market segments or sectors that you can hook up connected devices and all these connected devices connect to the cloud through the smart converged gateway and once you have this horizontal platform which we'll talk about enabled by java osgi then it will make it easy for all the businesses to add vertical segment solutions or vertical applications software uh, so uh, on the connected transportation, on the upper left, I talk about asset tracking. Asset tracking can be tracking uh, uh, goods, but it can also track human beings like kids or elderly and so on. Uh, and then uh, for the factory and industrial that cover agriculture. So you can basically imagine anything you see in the smart cities can be all interconnected. So we talk about interconnecting and co intercooperating uh, among all these objects, if you will. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's dive in into the smart energy. Um, so um, the smart energy, I will show that there are three different topics, if you will. The first topic is called metrology in the middle. Metrologies are meters, whether it's electric meters, gas meters, water meters. Gas meters and water meters are called flow meters. It, it detects the flow of either water or gas. While electric meters is sensing the consumption of electricity. So, so again, it's just replacement of different sensors. Then uh, the utility company, the first thing they do is to install smart meters in your home. Uh, then uh, they started with something called AMR, Advanced Meter Reading, which now will be replaced by what we call AMI, Advanced Metering Infrastructure. So the difference is with the AMI, you no longer need to, I hope this was long enough, you no longer need to send a meter person to drive the car close to your meter, so it would be all aggregated automatically by what we call either a data concentrator or data aggregator, which usually is uh, installed on the utility pole uh, in your residential area. And each uh, data concentrator can probably aggregate about 1,000 meters. And so in a city, you, you can imagine each high-rise building will also have a couple of this data concentrator within the building. So it can be inside the building, it can be outside the building. But usually data concentrators are ruggedized, they uh, are weatherproof, uh, waterproof, so the enclosure uh, will be uh, tougher. And uh, the components we put in there are usually extended temperature range, uh, not, not the regular commercial, it's called industrial uh, core rather than commercial core. Uh, so then, uh, so that take care of the utility company, they install that uh, their concentrator help do the automatic meter reading, but it's a bi-directional interface, so it's not just aggregating meter reading, but they also can assert control, which we call demand control and load shedding, we'll talk about that next. 
Um, then on the right hand side is when you push inside each premise, each premise now has a bunch of appliances that will be all connected. And how does the owner of each premise be able to do remote monitoring control of those appliances? Um, so I don't see Bill Gates here. I would like to make fun of Bill Gates. So for him, it would be uh, controlling his uh, hot tub jacuzzi, or uh, maybe Larry Ellison, maybe I should make fun of him. For Larry Ellison, it will be uh, taking care of his swimming pool. For Microsoft, it will be uh, Bill Gates, it will be his uh, hot tub jacuzzi. For us, usually the um, appliances that consume most electricity will be the uh, HVAC uh, heat heating and conditioning, and maybe the uh, washer dryers, stuff like that. So really, it's only a limited number of devices you will control for energy purpose. However, within a home, you may want to add other uh, sensors for safety and security. So now you start expanding the RAM. So for, sense, uh, for safety, security, you can add smoke alarm. Smoke alarm sensors are different than sensing electricity for current. So smoke alarm will be sensing smoke, sensing temperature. And if you add additional security, uh, wireless security, you can sense uh, glass breakages for your windows. You can sense motion detection. And for more fancy stuff, you can start adding uh, video surveillance camera. Uh, video surveillance camera, what's inside is image sensor. So these are much higher data rate uh, sensor. Um, so, uh, We'll go into that. So in a smart connected home, you'll see all this multitude of sensors. And so in order to be able to let the owners to control it, you also need a smart um, home gateway, if you will, aggregating all this data, connecting to the cloud. While you're away from the home, you can still do remote monitoring control. Not, not just, again, on your meters or your appliances, but a surveillance camera would be an example. What's your name? If Tom is going out partying, having uh, drinks, while party, playing golf, whatever, he can still use his handset and he can still connect to the cloud, connect back into the gateway. So gateway is not just a one-way routing, connecting uh, internet access. So it's a two-way. So, so a smart gateway is a two-way uh, platform. So it actually hosted the domain name server. It hosts a web server. You can connect back in, authenticate it. Now you can see all your IP camera, making sure Tom's kids are not having wild party also while he's having wild party. So that's one use case example. Any comment? Any question? OK, so this is an example of a smart grid. We call it the last mile. The last mile contains those type of components. But of course, if you work upstream, if you work upstream, you have a lot more networking uh, equipment that will do all the control of the distribution and generation of electricity. Because you work upstream, you'll be connected to the uh, substations and so on. So this is the world's largest uh, factory, if you will. It's an open factory. So anything you apply to an open factory can be applied to a smaller scale closed factory. That makes sense so far? OK, so I forgot to mention, what are the challenges here in smart uh, grid or smart energy? So we have a uh, utility company, which first of all, we have many utility company. Within each utility company, they also purchase many different meters. Uh, there's no uh, LED light, I guess. Uh, anybody have a pointer? No pointer? OK, that's fine. Uh, so uh, since we uh, have so many vendors that uh, build meters, uh, the different meter vendors also use different uh, devices, whether it's an ARM device uh, or, or some microcontrollers. And then you also have different messaging API. Because all this data you are aggregating ultimately need to collect it through the data concentrator and to the substation and utility service. We have various transceivers. Transceivers are RF radios, if you will, uh, sensing, receiving uh, all this low data rate data. And then, uh, again, because you have so many meters, you want to also have ability to do remote provisioning, remote installation, and ease of deployment. 
Okay, so let's uh, dive into the middle circle uh, and start with the meter, start with the wireless sensor and how all this converge. Uh, gateway help us to do all the interconnectivity and the inter uh, uh, cooperating among all these sensors. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, in the middle is the smart meters. Uh, why, why do we call smart anyway? Anybody have any comment? Why, why do I call this a smartphone? Uh, why do we start calling our TV smart TV? Okay, so smart means uh, you must uh, be internet connected. That's one thing. So network connected. So now every devices will be network connected, will be cloud connected. Second is it will have a lot of software in it that uh, will be adaptive. That means you can load any different type of apps you want to make it smart. Okay, so we have smart meters. Uh, so it's, by definition, it has ability to connect to the cloud, and it also have software to also automatically connect to all the upstream network. So on the left, as I mentioned, is a data concentrator. In this example, it's a free scale uh, dual core uh, PowerPC device that can aggregate up to 1,000 meters, as I mentioned. Uh, on the left, I show two items within the home uh, one is a smart gateway that, as I mentioned, can connect all your sensors, your video surveillance camera, and also all your internet access, all your residential um, gateway functions, if you will. So you can do DLNA media streaming, you can do uh, VOIP uh, phone call, you can do uh, video surveillance, everything. So not just smart metering. Uh, so that's a smart gateway there on the right. There's a smart gateway on the left. One is indoor, one is outdoor. And then on the lower right is yet another smart device, which uh, sometimes people call a smart thermostat, sometimes people call a programmable communicating thermostat, PCT. So uh, a PCT is an IPv6 uh, enabled device, it means that device is directly connected to the cloud, even you don't need a smart gateway. So it's IP addressable by the utility company. Hopefully it's also by each homeowner. So uh, one of the use case scenarios is some city, uh, the utility company as an incentive, instead of installing a regular digital thermostat, which usually is free of charge now, they will say, hey, how about if I upgrade it to the PCT, where it's IP addressable. If you let the utility company access it, uh, and let us control plus or minus five degree, let's say whatever is the agreement, you can opt out, you can opt in, then in return the utility company will give you some incentive, let's say 10% discount on your monthly usage. The purpose of doing that is so that utility company, when it's aggregating the meter reading on the left, they start noticing the consumption by your development or your uh, air, uh, how should I say, your res residential area, your, your, your subdivision is what I mean. If they notice your subdivision start having more consumption than the supply can handle, there's a pending brownout. Once they notice that there is a pending brownout, they have to prevent it because the cost of having a brownout is very expensive, especially in a big city like San Francisco or Manhattan, New York. Especially Manhattan, New York, when it goes down, then all the... Um, stock trading will be impacted, so it's millions of dollars of losses. So uh, the incentive is for utility company to prevent brown out, brown out. So once they sense that imbalance, they have to do load shedding. When they do, do load shedding, there are two forms. One is they can send messages to your meter, increase your tariff rate, so that's called peak tariff rate. Some cities apply that, some cities don't. So once they detect it, they can increase the peak rate and then your smart gateway can notice it. Once your gateway notices it, you can defer energy consumption, such as you can defer using washer dryer, defer using your hot tub jacuzzi for an hour maybe. Um, or if you have a smart thermostat, you can also allow, because sometimes you're away from home, you're on vacation, you can also allow to let the utility company to adjust your thermostat, dialing it down by five degrees or something. So that's how the whole network work. So again, it doesn't need to work with human being interruption. It can uh, work automatically by all these distributed uh, gateways because it has embedded software there so it can just do the uh, 
adapt, dynamic uh, adaptive adjustments in real time. A any questions, comments so far? Okay, so uh, I, I put something, uh, I, I put AMI, Advanced Metering Infrastructure, on the left. That's the incentive from the utility company. I put demand response load shedding, how we can handle that on the localized per premise basis. But of course, on the left hand side, uh, since the utility company are also dealing with a network of um, uh, all this uh, data concentrator, they can also do some dynamic low uh, balancing uh, out, out there upstream, not, not just local. Um, so on the uh, lower side, I give an example of a smart thermal stack. How many of you heard about Nest? Good, good. I, I, I think this is a very smart uh, implementation. Uh, they call it the Apple Lite implementation because it's actually done by someone that left Apple. Um, and it has all the Apple type of user interface, which is very easy to use. So even my neighbor know how to use it and, <laughs> and so on. Uh, but it's not cheap, it's very expensive. I think it's $249 or something, right? But, but it can do a lot of stuff. It, it has uh, learning ability, it can learn your usages and uh, um, it, uh, it can tell you uh, time to, uh, when you set uh, a certain temperature, it will tell you how long it will take to adjust to the temperature that you want. It will tell you whether you are on um, energy saving mode, where a, a green leaf will pop on if you are saving energy, all this stuff. And here's all the built-in smart when, um, to save energy by, by sometimes that it will shut down the air conditioning but leave the fan on, that type of stuff. So it has a lot of fancy uh, capability. Okay, so let us talk uh, a little bit about all this wireless. Uh, remember I mentioned that all these sensor devices uh, has to be interconnected through wireless sensors. So wireless sensor has many form and so uh, let's talk about the different data rate, which is the performance on the left hand side, and then the ranges, which is the distance you can cover. So we are all familiar with the cell phone, which is the 3G, 4G. It has a long range distance, but it's actually low data rate. So you can do two megabit per second. Maybe you can sign up for up to 10 megabit per second. That's 3G, but 4G LTE is coming. So Freescale is involved with all the 4G LTE development, so it's supposed to go up to uh, 100 megabit per second. So that's the uh, cellular broadband connectivity. Then uh, on the center, the big circle is the Wi-Fi connectivity, which has evolved from AO2.11A and B to 11N. AO2.11N can give you um, 100 megabit per second on a 2x2 radio, up to 300 megabit per second for a 3x3 radio. And then AO2.11AC is coming, which gives you 1 gigabit per second wireless. So these are your high performance wireless local area network for your premise, for your office, for your home, and so on. And this one has much higher performance than the cellular broadband. You can tell it's a 10 times difference in performance but then it's short, shorter distance. That's the trade-off. On the lower, lower bottom, I show two type of uh, radio. There's the Bluetooth, which we are familiar with uh, dealing with uh, streaming songs, uh, music player, doing uh, connection of the cell phone through uh, us, uh, through Bluetooth uh, headset and so on. So that's the Bluetooth capability. Of course, uh, uh, people are also extending Bluetooth to call Bluetooth 4.0, Bluetooth low power, um, that try to lower the power consumption further. But the distance wise is the shortest distance coverage. Then here comes SIGBI. SIGBI is a sensor that can range from 2.4 gigahertz all the way down to 868 uh, or 900 megahertz. So it has a variety of uh, frequency range and then it gives you a much longer distance than Bluetooth, and therefore it's more suitable for connecting multitude of different sensors. And of course, performance-wise, it's lower performance than your wireless gateway. So now what you envision is you have all these objects or devices, meters and um, 
I don't know what kind of sensors, smoke alarm, uh, whatever, now need to be connected. So it would be hard for them to connect directly to the cloud, which is up there, which we call the WAN, uh, uh, wide area network. So usually then you can connect through the WLAN, wireless local area network, and that will connect to the WAN, to the cloud for you. Um, so what's... Uh, the, the, the sensor network usually is a mesh network. So all this sensor can be all interconnected together as a mesh. Uh, and sometimes we call it the PAN, personal area network. And this is uh, basically a wireless sensor network. Why, why we call, uh, why, down, uh, first of all, um, down here, this mesh network, sometimes it's also called resilient network, self-healing network. So let me give you an example. If I have a bunch of smoke alarm here, uh, some in the first floor, some in second floor, some in east wing, some in west wing, if one sensor detected fire, and, but then it's trying to relate the messages to the controller, the controller could be downstairs on the first floor, it will try to relate, but then if you find out on the north wing the sensor is down, it will reroute and go to another sensor. So it will find its way dynamically route it and then it will connect to your uh, controller which will dispatch all the messages to 911 or, or whatever, uh, fire trucks and so on. Um, so, uh, so far so good about mesh networking? Okay, so it's called an adaptive network. WLAN Wi-Fi network it usually is called an ad hoc network. So it usually is not interconnected as a mesh network. But we can also interconnect uh, all the wireless network together, it, we call them an access point. When you start interconnect multiple access point together, you can bridge them, you can repeat them, so we can also form a, a network. So in most offices, we have a network of access point. Um, so that's the general picture. So uh, with Wi-Fi, a local area network, you usually have much higher bandwidth, you can handle video surveillance. So usually video surveillance cannot be handled directly by the sensors. Um, and then there's actually a third axis which is called power consumption. So, so of course when you deal with sensors, this has to be long battery life. So for health monitoring purpose, uh, sensing blood pressure and all, all this stuff, or uh, the heart um, thing, you don't want to be charging up your battery every day and so it has to be very long battery life. Uh, same thing for gas meter. Gas meter also has to be, at least uh, the battery will last uh, over five years because uh, gas meter do not have direct um, e electricity connection and you know the reason because it will explode. So uh, gas meter will have to have long battery life also, whatever sensors you put into those. Um, that makes sense so far? Any questions? Okay, so the, we talk about smart sensors being put into all these devices, has to be connected to the cloud so we can uh, do remote monitoring control. We can also allow the utility to put in all kinds of uh, business applications. So what's inside in the middle is, we call it the smart converged gateway. Okay, so Freescale also offer different type of uh, sensor devices. At the uh, sub gigahertz level, as I mentioned, you can do the 800 range, 900 megahertz range. Those lower frequency sensor can go longer distance, can also penetrate wall. Uh, so um, we have the MC12311, so it's a programmable uh, radio. You can adjust different frequency. So it, we call SDR, Software Defined Radio. Um, and then we are also coming up with a Cortex M0 base uh, um, sub gigahertz uh, radio on the lower right. And then when you uh, move to the middle, you see some transceivers. Transceivers are just sensors, but no microcontroller. So it just send data. So if you want to have more control, you usually want to buy not just a transceiver, but buy a sensor that come with a microprocessor. Uh, so that take us to the um, top bar. The top bar, we uh, have an ARM7 base uh, um, MPU microprocessor integrated with the sensor called 13226. But now we're evolving into the MKW20, which is Cortex M4 base. Uh, so this type are called smart sensors now. 
at, at the bottom, this type of transceiver are more dumb. It just sends the data related. It cannot take actions. When you start doing smart sensors, it has microprocessor. It can do localized decision making. It can do more control and so on. That makes sense so far? OK. OK, so now that we understand the basic sensor, how sensor go into smart meters and go into all our other um, objects, uh, we will talk about the left hand side. The left hand box is called their concentrator, how it will aggregate all the meter readings from other dwellings. So here, here's a graphical picture. So you have the smart meter, which is thousands of them in the middle. And then there is a data concentrator that is in your subdivision, ag in, the, in the utility pole. Um, so you see all kinds of connectivity. Uh, you, you can have Wi-Fi connectivity. You can have PLC connectivity, power line communication. You can have SIGB connectivity at different frequency, 800, 900, 2.4. And then the back hall, uh, if it's uh, electric company, then you can have uh, PLC running on the power line. But if you're a gas meter, water meter, you do a 3G backhaul. So most of this meter will have a 3G backhaul capability to relate the aggregated data back to the utility server. OK? Uh, of course, 3G will be replaced soon by 4G and so on. On the left hand side is what's inside the home. And then as you see, interconnecting all your appliances and, and stuff like that. Now, the messages I want to relate in this picture is twofold. We connect all these things to the cloud so that we can allow you to have remote monitoring control. That's the important part. Second part is you notice all this stuff has a lot of messaging involved. The smart meter talking to their concentrator, if you have a smart gateway or, or whatever, a smart thermostat, they talk through a protocol called DLMS. DLMS is called Device Language Message Specification. Sometimes it's also called COSIM, Companion Specification for Energy Metering. Of course, there are other IEEE standards called OpenADR. So all this standard messaging API allow you to have different vendors, different meters, and they're concentrated to be all talking the same language. Uh, so that later on, we will talk about how Java and OSGI can help us with uh, that. Uh, message translation and so on. Then as the meter aggregated the data, it has to also send back to the utility server, the substation. So there's another standard on the left hand side called IEC 61850, substation automation <coughs> interfaces. So you, you can see that there's a lot of all this uh, messaging API that has to be involved. So at the bottom, you have uh, the embedded processes doing the sensing. In the middle, you have all this messaging trying to be all translated properly before you can relate upstream. And then at the top, you have the utility server company trying to add vertical business applications so that it will make it easier for us to remote monitor control. Oops. OK, so here again is our uh, example of a Freescale dual call P1025 data concentrator. Uh, you can see the uh, data concentrator on the utility pole aggregating multiple meters, thousands of them, so that uh, it can connect to the cloud. We call this a AMI again, Advanced Metering Infrastructure. It taught all those languages that we talked earlier on, DLMS and substation interfaces. There is a YouTube uh, uh, thing you can watch. And then on the right, you can see all the capability. The important capability in the data concentrator is called IEEE 1588 timestamp and also IPsec security acceleration. So because all this meter has to be encrypted and the data has to be protected and so on. Um, and the next release will add all the sub gigahertz and power line communication. So which version of Java is running? Is that like the Java embedded SE that we Heard about? Yeah, yeah. So I will show you the example SE, and then for the handset, uh, when you want to monitor, then you can have the Java FX running on your tablet, for example. So let me play um, play a video real quick. Uh, I hope we have time. Whoops. Um, so this way I can let you guys watch. coming up. 
Is the sound on? Hello, everybody. This is David Rosado, and we're here to demonstrate the Smart Energy Data Concentrator featuring the P1025 Core IQ device. The Smart Energy Reference Design Data Concentrator is the latest addition in the distribution and smart management of energy in the growing smart grid era. These, as you will see, the data concentrator will be capable of discovering smart metering devices, communicating with them flawlessly via various protocols, and transferring that information to the utility servers. The P1025, which powers the data concentrator, is a core IQ device with plenty of performance, dual core, in a lower power management envelope and also features clever capabilities like IEEE 1588 time stamping and security acceleration for an encrypted channel. Without further ado, here is a demonstration of the P1025 data concentrator. Hi, I'm Kwok Bu. I head up the NPD Networking Processor Divisions Segment Solutions Lab. Today I'd like to show you the Core IQ P1025 data concentrator used in the smart grid. I will show you the functionality and performance. And there are three things I'd like to show. Number one is the real-time energy monitoring, whereby the P1025 is a high-performance wireless secure router. It can connect to multiple meters, which is thousands of meters. It can aggregate the meter real readings in real time, such as, uh, for example, shown here on the screen. You can see all the power meter readings being sent back in real time to the utility servers. And then on the screen on your right hand side, you can see that as all the meter reading get accumulated, the energy consumption patterns get stored and displayed by the hours, by the days, by the weeks, where the um, consumer can access anytime, anywhere all these consumptions. And now I will get to point number two, the P1025 data concentrator also enabled the utility company due to a pending brownout can send messages to each smart meters, which is each smart home, and in addition can also adjust the uh, tariff rate. By adjusting the tariff rate, the um, utility company can then impact the um, homeowners to decide whether they turn off lighting, turn off heating and washers uh, and air conditionings and therefore prevent the pending brownouts and also um, save uh, the power consumptions. Number three, I'd like to summarize by saying that the P1025 data concentrator is a high performance wireless 3G broadband enabled router. Uh, it's equipped with IPsec, equipped with IPv6. Uh, it handles all the multiple level of wireless connectivity such as SIGBI and then we also plan to add the PLC power line com communication and the sub gigahertz RF uh, connectivity. For further information, please feel free to contact freescale.com slash smart energy. Okay, so let's continue, uh, move on. Um, so uh, what's inside the home is uh, uh, a smart home gateway as I mentioned, that can allow you to um, monitor your uh, uh, energy consumption by each appliances, control them on and off. You can monitor security, safety. You can uh, monitor your smoke alarm, monitor your video surveillance camera. You can do all kinds of home automations. Um, so within the home, you can have a smart gateway, but you can have a simple device uh, as much as uh, on the right-hand side, just displaying energy consumption, but no control. Or uh, somewhere in between, which is just a home energy manager, like, like, like the smart thermostat that we look at in the middle here. So this usually we call the HAM, the smart thermostat control. So you can have different type of energy uh, management devices. So uh, a smart gateway will be able to perform all this capability, um, connecting to all your appliances uh, on the left, uh, connected to the cloud, give you all the local area network capability, video surveillance, and all this stuff. 
this is the box that showed uh, this smart uh, home gateway um, box. Uh, basically, it's a converged gateway that can handle uh, wireless sensor network connection, which is Zigbee sensors, Wi-Fi connections, 3G connection, and all, all, all them, all of them combined. OK, so uh, this gentleman was asking uh, on the Java demo, what did we do? So again, it's the same thing that we have connected uh, with the data concentrator, with the meter, and with a handset device, uh, which is an IDA MX53 tablet. Um, so um, the meter is in the middle again, data concentrator on the left, uh, a smart home gateway on the right, the tablet on, on, on the top, which is away from your home, right? So uh, of course, all these are embedded processes. So a smart home gateway is an example like this. Um, and a data concentrator can be as small as this. This is the dual core P1025. And of course, when you put it outdoor, you will put a weatherproof enclosure and so on. Um, so we uh, worked together with Oracle, and Oracle actually put the Java VM and also another layer we call a messaging layer, which do all those uh, DLMS and uh, COSM and all those messaging translation. And but it's not related to the Java messaging server? No, no, no. Yeah, it, you, you have to write that yourself to interact with the specific market you're dealing with. So in this case, it's energy market. So we have to write those translations. So the meter get aggregated by the uh, data concentrator. It's sent to the cloud then uh, you can also interact with the Java BDB, which is your database, so it gets stored. And then now uh, you can access those data either through your smart gateway or through your smart handset, your tablet. And then on the tablet side, we added the Java FX, so. What's that, an I a modified iPad, or what exactly? Oh yeah, it's a modified iDynamics tablet. So iDynamics 53 is the free scale uh, ARM based uh, tablet. And the operating system? Uh, it was running Android, and then we basically modified it, and then we loaded Java FX onto it. But it is it's derived from Android? Uh, we actually strip out the Android. So it, 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 Android is sitting above the Linux, right? So we strip out the Android, so we still have Linux operating system, and then we add the Java FX. Uh, the reason is this way. We can have all these different boxes all interacting and all talking the same language and messages. That makes sense? And they can access the database. All this data that we're pushing out is, has to store in the utility server so we can access. OK, so that's the use case example. As I mentioned, these are all the different functions we implement on the data concentrator there on the top. And then on the bottom is all this uh, Java FX uh, that we added for the client access. And so again, you see the cloud connection. You see the database. So basically, all this data are being pushed to the cloud, being stored, and then being accessed. Uh, this uh, is other type of vertical application a utility company can write. So at the utility um, office, they can write smart grid automation software that they can display the grid, they can display how energies are being consumed, they can monitor if certain area has uh, a failure, how they can reroute the traffic and so on. So that's another application of Java FX for the utility company. OK, so in summary, uh, in this demo, Java VM, Java SE, Java FX is used and has been installed on all the different smart gateway, the home gateway, and also installed on the data concentrator. Um, so if you will, all these smart gateway are platforms. Now we are enabling it with Java. Uh, I believe in the open source uh, approach. What, once we have this uh, uh, platform enabled, it's easy for the utility company or even for individual to add different vertical applications on top. 
So again, carry on this uh, right ones, run anywhere, run anytime, and so on concept. So the, the, the list of stuff that has been uh, demonstrated is the use of the Java BDB for pushing the data uh, into the uh, cloud storage. That enable utility company to do MDM, metadata management, do billing services. They can further do uh, later on at uh, other uh, cloud service applications such as uh, data mining, analytic, and so on. So this is to analyze our usage pattern from today versus yesterday, from this month versus last month. If you see any unusual usages, you may have some problem, like you may have water leak if your water bill go up and you may want to know where is your water leak, for example. Um, so all this additional management control doing demand response, uh, uh, the value added. Uh, but now you have all this embedded device all interoperated, interconnected through this platform approach. Um, so it addresses the issues that we talked about earlier on, multiple ven meter vendors using multiple devices, different transceivers, different messages. It, it allows us to make it easier to do remote provisioning uh, of all these meters and uh, e ease of deployment and so on. And then on top of that, Java offers the security, scalability, portability. So in short, someone told me the slide should be called from Java API to ROI. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me talk about um, how do we now extend all this uh, M2M connectivity and Internet of Things to other market segments because whatever we connect just then for the energy and utility can be extended. So this is an example for health monitoring. You can extend to working with all the different sensors to check blood pressure, check temperature, all this thing. So in an elderly home, you can have each elderly person carry a band uh, walking around, and then the nurse station, the nurse is actually watching uh, video on demand, uh, Netflix streaming, and <laughs> but then each elderly person can get a monitor uh, still, and, and then the doctor out there playing golf can still watch what's going on. Okay, so, uh, with that, I want to uh, refer you to one more session if you are interested to see how Freescale can also help with uh, the other markets. Uh, so uh, by my colleagues Stephen Dean and Robert Thompson talking about how we apply the M2M and IoT technology for consumer industrial markets. And this will be for tomorrow, Thursday, 1.30. Also here, Hotel Nico at Golden Gate. Golden Gate, I believe, is on 25th floor. And actually, I have one more video to show you, but let me see. Let me go through the summary, then we'll do the video real quick. So again, we talk about the concept that there's no just one single cloud called homogeneous cloud out there. There will be many local cloud. A cloud in your home, a cloud in your clinic, a cloud in your office, a cloud um, in your car, whatever. So all this local cloud, you need to have smart converged gateway that can connect to all these devices through all this sensor that we talk about. Um, so we talk about you can apply to all these different segments. Again, the key is how connecting you to the cloud allow you to add vertical applications, allow you to have real-time monitoring control. You can see all forms of wireless and wire connectivity on the left. So that's how the smart gateway help you handle all this. Uh, so let's talk, talk a little bit about IoT and IOE. Once you have the M2M connectivity, once the smart gateway allow you to connect things and objects, so now you want to deploy cloud services, basically. So on the lower left is simple tracking, tracking of assets. Assets can be goods, assets can be uh, people, like kids and elderly. And you don't want the elderly to be wandering out shopping and they cannot find their way home. So that's tracking uh, or asset management. Then you can have security safety. You can add uh, something called contacts and location aware services. So where you go, then you, the smart sensor will know for th where you are going, what are the nearest uh, bank, what's the nearest gas station, and whatever was the nearest movie, and so on for you. So these are called location-based services. 
And context aware means you even can detect your mood and dep depending by sensing your uh, ESP, I guess. Um, <laughs> You can extend this thing to call gesture-based interface, or, or it's called uh, augmented reality. So you, you can extend this to um, a lot of stuff, basically. Um, then we talk about remote monitoring control. And then ultimately, we call this distributed embedded intelligence. We, we are talking about kinetic intelligence. Uh, we talk about not just having a simple IF radio in the sensors, just transmitting data, collecting data. We talk about putting in a cheap, low-cost microprocessor, where now you can enable each of the sensors to do distributed local intelligence. You can do is local data mining, is local decision making, and so on. So that's the trend. So this trend is called pervasive, ubiquitous, collaborative computing. So. Uh, we see Java, VM, and o OSGI, all these are basic platform enablement that allow us to put that in each of the smart gateway and smart devices and allowing us to have interoperating uh, nodes or, or, or devices, if you will. Uh, any comments, any questions? So again, uh, I have... Uh, terminology IoT and M2M, I change it to uppercase M. So it's not just machine talking to machine, it's machine talking to human being. So it's us, how do we interact with all these objects uh, in an intelligent fashion? And again, applying to not just smart energy, but smart homes, smart cars, smart buildings, and so on and so forth. Okay, so in summary, we talk about how a smart city, smart world can apply M2M connectivity, apply IoT, and then we added the Java technology to help us implement connected intelligence. We call it Edge to Enterprise. Edge are all these nodes at the end point. Enterprise is the back end, your utility server or your core network in telco, telecom. So by doing these connections, everything connected to the cloud, then we can enable all these cloud services, which we call B to B to C, means everything connected, right? Business to business to consumer. And you can now quickly and easily add different uh, business vertical solutions to connect all these things together. So that's my prepare uh, presentation, and I have one more um, uh, PowerPoint, sorry, one more uh, YouTube video to show you, uh, if you guys have time. So uh, this one, I'll show you the uh, smart home, smart connected home. Okay. Hello, I'm Nick Sargalogos. I'm product manager for the MPC 8300X product family. Today we're going to talk to you about the MPC 8308 Network Smart Gateway reference design. You see here the actual so platform, is, which allows applications such as uh, home, home uh, energy uh, communicating over Zigbee to a smart meter. Uh, we also can support applications like home automation, where we're using here a smart plug that has a Zigbee radio in it communicating to the platform. Uh, we use the MP MC13226 Zigbee radio, and I, will be, I can turn off an appliance using uh, the smart plug from the uh, network smart gateway by sending a command wirelessly to the gateway to turn off this light, which I'll do right now. Okay, uh, so what you've just seen is this tablet uh, connecting over 802.11 to the network smart gateway, the network smart gateway communicating over Zigbee to the smart plug, which allows us to control this appliance. Other appliances that could be controlled include things like this washing machine, uh, air conditioners, or other devices. Uh, this allows uh, the user to be able to control the demand that they have for electricity, reducing their overall consumption. Using the 802.11n radio that the NPC8308 Network Smart Gateway features, we can also stream high-definition video. This is coming off of an SD card that is in the Network Smart Gateway and streaming 802.11 to a Google TV you see uh, featuring 1080 uh, resolution. For more information about the MPC8308 Network Smart Gateway, please visit www.freescale.com slash smart energy. Thank you very much. 
So, uh, are there any questions? Yes. The video links, yes. Uh, yes, uh, here's the links to good, good uh, setup, good questions. <laughs> there are two links to our data concentrator and smart home gateway. There's also the next presentation tomorrow on the um, extending all this M2M -M IoT to the medical segments and industrial segments and uh, consumer segments. Tomorrow, one thirty. We're also talking about medical tomorrow. Tomorrow, talk about. They're also going to talk about medical use cases. Yes, yes. Them? They will actually expand my single um, the home health uh, monitoring into more detail. Uh huh. Yes. So I have a question. Um, how well is this product line being received? I think the dream of the intelligently submetered and intelligently controlled home. It has been a long time coming, and you know I think utilities have been slow to adopt that, um, at least in the past. How, how well has this been received? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, utility company, their motivation is more driven from the outside, so they don't want to push anything inside the home. They, they are not good at doing that. So they put the smart meter there so that they enable them to do AMI. So obviously, AMI is a big business. It's B, billions of dollars. So it's not M. So they already are seeing the benefit of implementing an AMI. That, that, because all these sensors, people call it neural networks, right? The key thing for them is not just meter reading, eliminate the need of sending a meter person, right? It's for doing demand response control. It's preventing brownout. So it's more political than economical, but I hope it will also bring economical reason. Because if you are the mayor of uh, New York City and Manhattan, your motivation is not to get publicized with Brown out. So that would be that some credit from you <laughs> when it's election time. So, so that, that's more politically driven on the outside. That's the utility company. What's going inside the home, back to your question about What's the motivation for smart home? I don't see that much dollar economical uh, incentive for saving your energy for a few dollars. However, if there is an increase of uh, electric uh, bills, uh, the, the oil, oil, oil prices, and there will be more people using electric car, so if there is indeed there is that increase in the electric car, we do have to figure out how not everybody come home at the same time plugging into the electric charger. So there is a certain need in one form. So the other form of smart home may not be electric uh, energy related. It could be uh, safety, security related in a smart home. So therefore, those provider will not be a utility company. It may be more driven by A, either the ATT, ADT is the security company, or B, a service operator like the AT&T, Verizon. So for inside the home, you will see those provider trying to push a smart home. So they will try, their incentive is try to add additional services for you. So the telco and the service operator will not be just offering you IP internet network access or digital phone access. Um, they will try to sell you additional services like video surveillance and all this thing, um, services. So that's another form of smart home. Um, so I hope that answered your question. It certainly, yeah. Yeah, okay. service, I mean, is, is it likely that all those things speak the same protocol already, such that they could be aggregated into a single device, like your, like your gateway, or is it, would it just be new things? Um, there are still evolving standards going on. The question is, uh, what's all this messaging API and standards and protocol? So in terms of the physical layer, we have the protocol standard like SIGB 1.0, SIGB 2.0. So I think we are all converging into a physical layer of standard protocol that has to be IPv6 compliant. Um, 
and we all need to have the uh, encryption capability to protect the data. So physical layer, I think converging, but the uh, messaging layer, there's still a variety of standards as you mentioned. So there's open ADR, there's the uh, DLMS, so hopefully it will stabilize soon. I mean, even, you know, you were describing like the, the Zigbee, I mean, they, they can encrypt that layer. I'm, I'm pretty sure like PG&E is not going to let me have access to, you know, even if the protocol is, is compatible, I won't be able to receive their messages because they, they really don't want yeah. to. Yeah. In, in fact, in many countries, they actually disable your home gateway to read your meter. So in many cities and in many countries, they only have the meter be accessible by the utility company. So they will upload it back to the server. From your home gateway or your iPad, you have to log in to the utility server. So they actually disconnect. <laughs> Some countries do that, so I guess. Um, but back to your messaging thing, that's where Java come in, right? Because if you have the, we, we call it the messaging layer that the utility company has to write. But once it gets written, it gives them the portability and the abstraction to make it easy to adopt and evolve. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very much. So uh, feel free to contact me if you have further questions. And, uh, Hope uh, to see you tomorrow also at 1.30, uh, 25th floor.